here is New York. Commuters give the city its tidal restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity. But the settlers give it passion. E.B. White would have described me as a settler. In fact, I became a New Yorker to pursue my passion for design. My name is Daniela Ohad. I'm here at Carpenter's Workshop Gallery to interview the architects, designers, curators, and critics who shape this season. Welcome to Harvest Dialogues. Robert Couturier is an architect and master of interior design, incorporating contemporary pieces in his spaces he has been a part of his global practice. I asked him here to comment on a Zaha Hadid architect's new interpretation of the shell chair, which originally was designed by Hans Wegner in 1963. Robert, how are you? Very good, thank you. Lovely to be here. When Zahadi designed furniture, she created forms that mirrored her cutting edge buildings. And I loved her pieces. I purchased a couple from David Gill Gallery. Have you ever seen them? Yes, I have. And uh, I love her design. I love the way that she creates furniture and the forms that she gives. I've bought myself a sofa which was a double-sided sofa, which sits in now in the middle of a living room in England, and always liked it. I have no problem with the design. But this chair, on the other hand, is a copy of a 1960s chair. And while I respect the science involved, it is crafted of marble and carbon fiber, I really don't understand it. I think um, it's a complicated answer and it has many sides. One is that it is a status symbol because I think if you are able to buy a piece of furniture as known as that one for as much as it is worth, it means that you have a lot of money and a lot of people today buy because what they buy is a telltale of how much money they have. So I think it is that. I think design-wise, it's very difficult to give value to design because it is her. It's an extension of her. It's an extension, extension of her creativity, which is valued because historically she is who she is and who she was. So I think that also things are worth what they are worth because somebody's ready to pay as much money for them. And if somebody's ready to pay $140,000 for it, what are we to say? You know, also the thing is that historically we think that furniture when furniture was created, it always was more expensive than it ever become afterwards. Give me an example. Okay, we, when the furniture was produced for Versailles and the, the king's desk, the king paid for his desk more than anyone has ever paid for a piece of furniture historically and even afterwards. So furniture was always very expensive and there always was furniture that was a symbol of your wealth. So I don't think it's very different today. I think today people buy that kind of furniture. We think, you know, we think that it shouldn't be worth as much money as it really is. And we don't think it's going to be worth that much more in a couple hundred years or even in 20 years. But it is a status symbol. And I think as long as there's a desire to appear, you know, as rich or as elegant as possible, there will always be. I'm also thinking that it is a byproduct of this market, which is very hot right now. Absolutely. I think it is a byproduct of this market, and I think this market is made even hotter because, you know, in the old days, people had designers from their own country. So you were French, you had French design, you were British, you had British design, you were whatever you had, whatever design you come from. Today, you have a few thousand people who collect the same thing worldwide. So they, the desire and the need for it is much greater. You might have had before 200 people who would have wanted it in one country, but today you have a multiple of countries that want it, a multiple of people who want it. So you have thousands of people who want it. So that chair that might have been worth only $15,000, but just because you have 300 billionaires who want one of them, then it's no longer 15,000, it's 150,000. 
But I'm going to tell you my problem with it. So we are here at Carpenter's Workshop Gallery, which showcases contemporary 21st century design. And it's not cheap, it's expensive. However, it's original. We sort of, we get, we take a piece of our time without home when we purchase it. And this chair reminds me something that Oscar Wilde said. He said that imitation is a sincerest form of flattery that mediocrity can pay the greatness. You're completely right. I agree, I think it is, I think it's to, to, not to use a word that was used before in such a nice way, it's a little deplorable, but um, it's sad. And I think history will make, the, will make the cut. I think that eventually, you know, what was not original and what will not be able to survive won't. I think because of what we are here, where we are here, and the furniture that's being produced by these artists here, I think always will. Because I think there is a true originality about what is produced in this Carpenter's Workshop Gallery by all the artists who work here. And I think what she has produced in that chair is not original. Chippendale is the most famous name in the history of furniture. But Chippendale is not a style. It is also not the mahogany heavy card furniture associated with the name. Thomas Chippendale was a London cabinet maker active in the 18th century, and the book that he published changed the course of history. To celebrate Chippendale at 300, the Met Open an exhibition co-curated by Alice Perry England. Alice, who was Thomas Chippendale? Well, as you mentioned, Thomas Chippendale was a British craftsman who was not only a furniture maker, but also a designer. His book was incredibly influential, not just on the British continent, but um, also in the Caribbean and also the North American colonies. Uh, ultimately, he was just a small town guy that he came from a place called Otley, which is in the northernmost part of England in Yorkshire. And instead of choosing his destiny of staying with his family business and the woodworkers that he had grown up with, he decided to trade his fortunes and go to London. And in London, that's where his life really changed. Um, he opened up a very large workshop. He also started to create some of the most influential design drawings um, in his studio. These design drawings would eventually be turned into The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director, which was first published in 1754. Chippendale's book, The Director, was extremely influential. What made this book such a blockbuster? The book was published in three different lifetime editions when Chippendale was active in London. There was an, an edition published in 1754, 1755, and then he added additional plates to that copy in 1762. And the book was influential in part because it ended up in the right hands. That in the introduction of the book, he opens his designs to any craftsperson that has the ability to make the designs. And if they're not to your, your liking, then you can certainly expand on them or mod modify things down to your liking. So that was one thing that he added an element of um, democracy in some ways to his design book that he could say, go ahead and use this book at will. In addition to that, the book ended up in um, roughly 308 subscribers' hands. There were 333 copies produced in the first edition, and then, of, of course, additional copies with the second and third editions. Those copies went to not only titled noblemen, but they also went to a good, good number of merchants and craftsmen. Those craftsmen were highly influential because they took his designs and replicated them for their clients, not just in um, the United Kingdom, but also in the American colonies. Talking about Chippendale's influence today, you included in the show a chair that Robert Venturi designed for Knoll in the 70s, and then it was produced in the 80s. And I would like to acknowledge the amazing architect Robert Venturi, who passed away last week, and his funeral is taking place today. I want to ask you about the influence of Chippendale 
today? Is there such a thing? Very much so. The Chippendales director has been influential for hundreds of years at this point. That it's probably one of the most long-standing furniture traditions alive today. And we saw it in the colonial revival, the late 19th century, this interest in the director. And we saw it through the early 20th century with this craze for anything antique. And now we see it in the 20th century with not only designers, well-known designers and architects like Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, they created a historic revitalization of Chippendale, that the chair that we included in our exhibit has an interlaced back that's pierced, it's cut to look exactly like the designs that Thomas Chippendale issued in his director. And at the same time, it's been revitalized in this new skin of molded plywood with a new synthetic fiber upholstered seat. So it's a wonderful example of this play how Chippendale can be timeless. Neil Aronowitz started his career as a builder and inspired him to start crafting furniture out of a unique innovative material, concrete cloth. In his Portland, Oregon studio, he creates award-winning sculptural handcrafted furniture. Neil, thanks for coming all the way from Oregon. My pleasure. What I find mostly compelling about your furniture is the way that you board a material from elsewhere to create furniture, but also the way that you succeeded in expressing the boundaries and the character of the material in furniture, and this is actually what makes design good design. What is concrete cloth? Well, Daniela, it's a very interesting material. It's high density concrete uh, sandwiched between two layers of canvas, and it was developed only about nine years ago, mostly for industrial purposes. It, it's waterproof, it can follow the contour of a form, and um, it's used for uh, lining ditches, for irrigation channels, and uh, it's also used for erosion control in hillsides. Helicopters roll down you know, almost like a carpet of the concrete cloth, and then they spray it with water. 24 hours later, it's hard. Uh, so it, you can get the strength of, and durability of concrete in a much thinner layer than you ordinarily need, so it has uh, environmental advantages. Um, what really caught my eye is that it's used for disaster relief shelters. So they'll bring a big bladder or balloon to a, a, like a flooded area, roll the concrete canvas over the bladder, spray it with water, and 24 hours later you have a shelter. So I was fascinated by the idea that concrete can, can be almost like a flying buttress in a Gothic cathedral, and it was light and airy. Now, designers have uh, worked with concrete and concrete canvas as well, but they've always used the sort of like the heavy, ponderous nature of concrete. And I saw the possibility of something, you know, lyrical or musical about it, almost like a magic carpet. And so I thought about it for years, and like, what can I do? How can I express the lightness of concrete using this material? And I want to ask you a little bit about the process, because I know your furniture is labor intensive. There is a lot of craftsmanship involved in it. What is the process like? The casting process is very interesting. The, the material is actually about 20 feet of, of material. So I, I've built pretty much like a bathtub, a trough, and I roll it out and wet it for about a half an hour. Then you have a half an hour to work before it hardens. So it's a kind of an intense process. You've got to get it right the first time. And there's no, you know, if you miss, you miss for, for good. So after 24 hours, it's hard enough that I can take the forms out. And then I start reinforcing it with metal wire, mesh, and to give it some structural strength. And then the final phase is skim coating it with uh, pigmented concrete, which takes about, probably about, the whole process is about 100, 120 hours. And it shows because your pieces are really to perfection. I hope so. Every, every square inch is laboriously and lovingly cared for. It totally shows, but I, I want to, you know, the furniture world is, has become so sophisticated, competitive. Um, it's an entire world. What, what is it about this world that you found intriguing that you want to be there? Well, you know, it's, it is very competitive. I haven't thought of it <coughs> that way, but um, it's, there's some amazing, wonderful quality work going on right now. And um, 
it's just you know, a privilege to be a part of it. And the lines between craft and art are really getting blurred because the, the work is getting so sophisticated. You know, when people write about my work, I'm either called an artist or a designer or artist designer, which I think speaks to the confusion about where is art and where is design. Um, but you know, I, I noticed in your program you have a, a quote that I really like. You, you talk about how when you notice design and make it a part of your life, your life becomes more beautiful. And I was very touched by that because I've noticed, uh, I just love the whole, you know, the people I meet, the collaborators, the, pe the assistants I work with, the collectors that I meet. They're, they're, there seems to be like a creative spark that people are interested in. They're trying to transcend mundane human existence. And art is that spark. And, and so the people I meet involved in the design world are very passionate. As a studio furniture artist, woodworker, writer, and educator, architect Yoav Lieberman has devoted his career and life to the world of reclaimed wood. Rather than crafting furniture out of newly harvested wood, he has practiced and taught the notion of reconfiguring wood and giving it a second life. Now in his new book, Working Reclaimed Wood, he has made these principles available to all. You have what is reclaimed wood? So uh, reclaimed wood is an umbrella term for, uh, for uh, a variety of uh, resources that, uh, of wood and wood-driven uh, product that receive a second uh, chance in life. They've been used for one purpose and then for uh, circumstances that um, render them maybe obsolete or maybe old, um, they've been used, they've been reclaimed for another purpose. Uh, they might end up uh, in the landfill or in our fireplaces if we didn't do that. Um, we can look, think about some uh, examples. For instance, we sit here on Fifth Avenue in, in New York and many of the buildings have uh, water towers. Uh, these are containers made of wood, um, even in the 21st century. After decades of use, the, that wood, which is pristine wood, it's uh, cedar or cypress, uh, um, reach its limits and then it can be dismantled and it's also sustainable and I want to ask you what are the advantages of using reclaimed wood? That, that's a great question. There are a few uh, um, advantages or um, uh, values that I, I identify within reclaimed wood. One of them of course is the ecological aspect of it. Um, instead of uh, that material, beautiful material that grew for centuries in, in trees end up uh, in a dump or being mulched or being burned uh, we are giving it another chance. We are using it, repurposing it, reclaiming it into uh, a new creation. So that's, that's the uh, ecological element. And then there's the aesthetic. Many reclaim uh, wood, especially that came from old buildings, uh, possess uh, aesthetics that you cannot find in the same species if harvested today. Tightness of the grain, the color, uh, the, the weight of the, of the timber. They are unique to old growth timbers and you can find them only in reclaimed resources. And then there is the as aspect of uh, value that is through the story. Many reclaimed wood comes from farmhouses, from um, uh, factories that are tw 200 years, 300 years old. Um, they have seen a lot. They've been stepped on by many, many generations. Uh, maybe famous pe uh, first people uh, used to uh, dwell in these houses. So when you take that, that wood and you, you give it a new purpose in life, you come up, that wood comes with a story. And a story, a narrative, is such an important aspect of design today. But I want to ask you, who are the participants? Who are the makers? today that make furniture out of reclaimed wood? So, so many of these makers are interior designers who by the uh, requirement of their customers want to include a material that is uh, period correct. So if you are adding an addition to a historic home, you want to have the material in the addition to be as historical and as, uh, and as appropriate as the original material. That is one uh, uh, group of, of users. The other group is um, 
I would say hipster artists uh, who are beginning their career and they can actually go to the loading dock of uh, a department store and get free wood from the pallet wood or the boxing and use it in um, a shikish uh, furniture. That's another group. And then there is the, the group of uh, studio furniture maker who would want to have, say, uh, heart pine or longleaf pine uh, that has amazing uh, orangey color and reddish uh, stripes into a bench. And only reclaimed wood probably can give them that uh, sort of aesthetics. You have entered this dynamic and totally interesting territory 20 years ago uh, or more. Um, what is the most surprising story that you discovered when working on this book? Great question. Um, I, there's a story in the book about a, a table that was built by a French uh, furniture designer, uh, Maria Perguet. And um, she received a slice of wood that began uh, that germinated in 1685 and one, one, is one of the darling woods of uh, Queen Marie Antoinette. That wood, an oak tree, uh, uh, grew, matured, saw the French Revolution, saw the age of the reign of terror, so two, two world war, and succumbed to a storm in the 90s. Uh, the, the wood, the tree, was sliced into uh, parts and then artist um, Maria uh, Perguet incorporated it into a completely modern table. So you can see a combination of sleek me metal and glass, and then in the middle we have a capsule of history, a slice from a tree, and you can actually count the annual ring and know that in that year, that and that happened. Joe Ponti is known as the Dean of Modern Italian Design. He founded Domus Magazine and created endless commissions in architecture, interiors, and industrial design in a very long career. Ponti also designed a cabinet for Singer & Sons, which was recently sold at Rego Auction. Nicholas Kilner has made his name as a specialist in 20th century Italian design. Talking about Italian modern design of the mid-century, which is your area of expertise, there was an interesting exhibition that toured America in the very early 50s. It was called Italy at Work, a Renaissance in Design Today. Right. And this exhibition came to influence how Americans viewed Italy as a capital of design, as a new capital of design Absolutely. during that time. Yeah, it, the, the, the importance of the show can't be overstated. It was at the time billed as the largest museum show ever to be brought to the US. And it consisted of uh, over 2,500 uh, individual objects by over 150 different artists. And the curators led by uh, uh, the, the selection team led by curator Merrick Rogers and Walter Dorwin Teague, among others, traveled around Italy to the ateliers and workshops throughout the country um, to f spending over a two year span to find work for the show, which when it opened in 1950 uh, at the Brooklyn Museum, it, uh, it was a, uh, to, to great success and then traveled around the country to f 12 other museums between 1950 and 1953. Um, interestingly, the, the entire show was uh, related in many ways to, to the um, program of financial assistance that the America was providing to Italy. In 1948 alone, the American government supplied almost $5 million to the Italian craft and design sector to revitalize the industries. And this show was very much part of that effort to introduce Italian design to the American public with a view to increasing commercial interest. So it was of fundamental importance to American, to the Italian, to the Italian design. And this particular cabinet belongs to typology, which is very iconic, to Panti. It's, it, it, it's you see this idea that he uses in this cabinet, this sort of split relief facade in a, in a number of his works. It, it's essentially the, the cabinet consists of four drawers with floating panels across the front. This is something that you see in various different. 
um, ways in the furniture he made for the Paco de Principe and the Royal Hotels, for the, Nordquist, uh, for the Nordica and Lundquist um, commissions in Sweden, for some of his private commissions, but it's this idea of a uh, floating panel to replace a handle. These floating panels are obviously very sculptural, they're the decoration, but they're also the handles, they it, serve it a function. It is so, so brilliant and, and beautiful. And infinitely beautiful. adaptable, which you see throughout his work. So it's classically Ponty. Eames referred to Ponty as, as a designer who, who, who finds architecture in everything he does, and this is absolutely the case in this idea. And, and this particular cabinet, how do you grade it as a collectible piece? How, how should we look at it? Well, there are a few uh, aspects to look at in that. As a collector, rarity is always of primary importance, and all the Singer pieces were made in multiple, or the majority were made in multiple, so that is something to consider. But the Singer pieces have for a long time been a very good deal, uh, in my opinion. They're brilliantly well made, um, and they're, they're, they were actually made in Italy. Regardless of the fact that Singer had a factory here in New York, the, the pieces were all made in Italy by the same companies that were making the domestically, domestic market pieces for these designers and they were shipped in parts to the US, Singer would assemble them and then apply a varnish to the piece that he thought made it more appropriate for the American market. So, so in other words, the pieces were produced in Italy, then shipped here, assembled in New York, and then varnished. Absolutely, but varnished in specific tones that Singer found appropriate for the American market, which in many cases today, um, haven't survived quite as well. How do you grade this piece? Um, I, I think this is an excellent piece. The, the estimate at the auction is incredibly low. The reason being, or the reason they state the uh, estimate is so low, was that uh, the piece had had some restoration, um, which is an interesting conversation because as with most pieces in this period, original condition is something that collectors really look for. Um, but as I'd mentioned in the, in the Singer pieces, the Singer would apply this varnish um, that he thought suited the American market. The designer, specifically Ponty, didn't like this practice, and Ponty wrote to Singer objecting about it, asking him not to do this because it was hiding the nature of the wood underneath. So, in my opinion, refinishing one of the Singer pieces, as particularly uh, as has happened in this case, is a positive aspect That's because really the wood's underneath. That's really interesting because it really brings the piece to where Ponty wanted to be. Exactly, and if you see the the quality of the walnut veneers in this particular piece, they're outstanding. Um, and so I think the restoration in this case is a, is a, is a positive attribute. And thanks Thank for you. being here and for illuminating on how should we look at Ponty furniture. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode is brought to you by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.